Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro, and I sit on the Board of Trustees of the International Menopause Society. And today, I'm very happy to be joined by Dr. Mike McClung. And we're going to focus on not only osteoporosis, but prevention. First, Dr. McClung, can you introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. I am a clinical endocrinologist, uh, the director of the Oregon Osteoporosis Center in Portland, where for almost 50 years, I've been involved in caring for Patients with osteoporosis and related disorders have been involved in multiple clinical trials, developing medicines for both the prevention and treatment of osteoporosis, and have served on the boards of the North American Menopause Society and the International Osteoporosis Foundation. So no one better to talk to us about this topic. We focus a lot about treatment of osteoporosis, but let's take a step back and talk about prevention and why that might be better than simply treating it as it happens. Well, it all has to do with what osteoporosis is, which is, you know, is a, not just low bone density, but as women lose bone uh, after menopause and then with aging, there is a progressive deterioration in the structure, the architecture, and the strength of the skeleton. Most of the drugs we have to treat osteoporosis are anti-remodeling or anti-resorptive drugs that inhibit bone resorption, but they also inhibit bone formation. And so they do not restore the architectural deficit that characterizes osteoporosis. We do have some bone building drugs and they can partially restore that, but you can't put it all back. And it would be, uh, in my opinion, easier uh, and perhaps more appropriate to prevent osteoporosis from happening in the first place. And we can talk about how we can do that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about screening. You know, often we talk about bone mineral density testing, and we don't want to screen the worried well, which was a problem that we had. And now we sort of have swung the pendulum the other way, where we think about only doing bone mineral densities at age 65. So what guidelines exist to remind us that maybe there is a time where we test younger women. Yeah, well, from the very beginning of guidelines, uh, beginning in 2000, when the American National Osteoporosis Foundation had their first guidelines, it was recommended that women at risk for osteoporosis be screened. That included older women, so age 65, but also younger postmenopausal women who either had a fracture, had a family history of osteoporosis, or maybe most importantly, who were thin, because body weight is actually the strongest uh, predictor or correlate of bone density in healthy perimenopausal or early postmenopausal women. So let's talk about the role of calcium and vitamin D. There's been so much controversy about how much calcium to take. Should it be from your diet? Can you take too much calcium? What about vitamin D? I know in Canada, we certainly do not absorb vitamin D. And the role specifically in preventing bone loss in and around menopause. Right. So you're right. There are many controversies about that. It, it, it is probably possible to take too much calcium and vitamin D are both threshold nutrients. Too little is not good, but more than enough is not better. And mm -hmm. so, but uh, uh, many women, all of us would, would uh, ideally like to do general measures to prevent bone loss from happening. But the bone loss that happens quite rapidly during the perimenopausal transition is due to estrogen deficiency, not to calcium deficiency. And many studies, including those that we've been involved in, have shown that increasing calcium intake, exercise, none of those are, are while they're important, they are not effective in preventing the bone loss that happens in early menopause. Well, they're important for muscle so that we can maintain ourselves and not fall, but you're right, disappointingly, they don't. You know, and most of the treatments, and is this, this is going to be countries, you know, specific, and we are an international society, so it's going to vary by jurisdiction. But much of, of what we read about are treatments for diagnosed osteoporosis and the woman at high risk for fracture. What about any approved treatments for the notion of prevention? So we don't wait till we get there. We actually are proactive in terms of the journey to osteoporosis. Right. So most guidelines do focus on identifying women at high, who, who have osteoporosis who are at high risk of fracture and then treating them to prevent the fracture from happening. The concept of preventing osteoporosis is to identify women who are at risk for developing osteoporosis, but who don't yet have it, 
and then to take steps to uh, to prevent that. Uh, the FDA in my country and in other countries has uh, approved drugs for treating osteoporosis based on large clinical trials uh, where documented fracture risk reduction is known. Uh, but there also are drugs approved for preventing osteoporosis, including oral and transdermal estrogens, estrogen with basidoxephine, raloxifen, and the four bisphosphonates. Interestingly, the doses of alendronate and zoledronate approved for prevention are half the dose that is approved for treating women with mm -hmm. established osteoporosis. And it's important to consider that because the, the bone loss that happens in the early menopausal years, where there's a, a phase of relatively rapid bone loss, that's associated with a substantial uh, decrease uh, and deterioration in bone architecture. And that can be, uh, if, if it's not prevented, it can't be reversed, but it can be prevented with either uh, estrogen or with low-dose bisphosphonate therapy. So if we focus on prevention, what about the evidence that links osteoprevention to reducing fracture risk? It seems like it would be self-evident that if we prevent the development of osteoporosis and the bone decay that you're talking about, that we would reduce fracture risk. But do we have evidence for that? Well, uh, uh, indirectly. So um, the, none of the prevention studies that led to the approval of drugs for prevention were big enough or long enough to document fracture risk reduction because the women at that moment when they were in the study were not at high risk. Uh, but we now know that uh, bone density is clearly a very important uh, predictor of fracture risk in older women. So it's intuitive that that's true. The best data we have, uh, though it probably comes from the Women's Health Initiative, which ironically is the study that uh, <laughs> led to to, to women not taking estrogen, but in that study, women uh, enrolled average age 62 uh, who were not selected for having osteoporosis, uh, it was shown that estrogen therapy was very effective in mm -hmm. reducing fracture risk. And estrogen is effective in uh, maintaining bone density and maintain fracture risk in that study as long as it was given. And then if or when estrogen is stopped, the benefits go away very quickly. Right. And that's often not understood that uh, additional steps need to be taken if estrogen is discontinued to maintain the benefit. Yeah, we often don't talk about that. We do talk about that, for example, with treatment with monoclonal antibodies, that if you stop the treatment, you have to seal the deal. The notion of women who want to get off menopausal hormone therapy, even though there's not a mandatory stop date. Should we think be thinking about that as well, that when we stop them from their menopausal hormone therapy, they will have a rapid decline? Should we think about what step to do in terms of sealing the deal, if you will? Sure. Particularly if we've chosen or had menopausal therapies with the specific objective of preventing osteoporosis. Discontinuing estrogen, there is a rebound in bone remodeling and a rapid decrease in both bone density and vertebral fracture protection, just like we see when monoclonal antibody therapy is discontinued. Mm -hmm. And we know that being on alendronate uh, or one dose of zalendronate, but being on alendronate for two years uh, prevents that loss from happening. And then after that two-year time, uh, a discontinuation of alendronate uh, results in maintenance of the bone density. And then beyond that time, intermittent therapy with uh, low-dose low bisphosphonates for maybe two years at a time, mm -hmm. every five years or so, uh, is a strategy that could and will maintain bone density over the remainder of a woman's life. So let's talk about guidelines because we have so many different guidelines. We've just come up with new guidelines in Canada that really do focus on pharmacological therapy and the choice of pharmacological therapy for treatment. So do any guidelines actually take that additional step in terms of recommending pharmacological therapy to prevent osteoporosis? Yeah, the, the North American Menopause Society position statement from 2021 is the, the, the one set of guidelines that specifically uh, address that issue. And they made the statement that for women who come to menopause with low bone density, that is a T-score of minus one or lower, that in those women that we should consider uh, the use of hormone therapy or perhaps other pharmacologic uh, agents uh, for prevention 
uh, it, it wasn't mandated that all women require therapy, but we certainly should consider that, particularly in women with other risk factors, such as a family history or uh, mm -hmm. a, a prior history of fracture, even though they don't meet the criteria for being treated for osteoporosis. So we've talked about what happens if estrogen is discontinued. And I want to reiterate is, you know, the notion of should we be stopping estrogen um, and, and how long estrogen should be or can be taken? Well, there there is um, no limit, I think, in, in how long estrogen should be taken. Uh, after the Women's Health Initiative, the recommendation was that women should be on the lowest dose of estrogen for the shortest time possible. Right. But I think that there's uh, much rethinking about that with the reanalysis of uh, the Women's Health Initiative, particularly uh, when the women who were between ages 50 and 60 in that study were focused on, where the, the risk benefit was clearly obvious, uh, particularly in those, of course, with vasomotor symptoms. But even without vasomotor symptoms, the overall benefit far, far outweighed the risk. Uh, always uh, individualization of therapy and uh, discussion with the patient is important. Women with a family history of breast cancer, where that's a concern, we would think differently, perhaps, about hormone therapy. But there's no a priori limit to the mm -hmm. duration of estrogen therapy. And if a woman cannot or will not take estrogen? Uh, in that situation, we again, we know from studies that we and others have done that uh, oral bisphosphonates begun in early menopause are very effective in preventing bone loss. That phase of relatively rapid bone loss, though, is relatively short. It's only four, or five, six years. So perhaps uh, an, uh, an interval of alendronate therapy for three to five years, followed then by uh, intermittent uh, bisphosphonate therapy, would be the strategy for long-term prevention uh, in the absence of using estrogen. Well, and thank you so much. In, you in, know. in those patients, uh, raloxifen, after the after the initial phase of alendronate, then raloxifen actually might be a drug uh, that could be used for long-term maintenance of bone density uh, beyond the, the rapid phase of bone loss in early menopause. It gets us, I think, rethinking, you know, that maybe we should be focusing a little bit before that time where we identify those high-risk patients who have fractured or imminent risk of fracture or refracture, and perhaps in those menopausal women who are sitting with our bone mineral densities well above the minus 2.5, but well below the minus one, we should be rethinking these women. Right. Well, th th this idea is not new. We, we thought about this and talked about this uh, uh, 20 plus years ago, but it was thought uh, to be not cost effective back in those years. But mm -hmm. that was when both estrogen and alendronate and bone density testing were much more expensive than they are today. And at least in the United States, with the current cost of drugs, uh, treating a woman with estrogen followed by intermittent alendronate from ages 50 to 80 can be accomplished for less than $5,000 which mm -hmm. is way less than one year of bone building therapy for the treatment of women who have developed osteoporosis that we're trying to uh, to rescue. Or the treatment of a hip fracture. Exactly, exactly. Well, thank you so much for joining us and really shifting our perspective when it comes to prevention versus treatment in osteoporosis. Oh, good to see you. Thanks, Marla.